Story five of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day Ten Christmas Stories by Edward Everett Hale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story five Stand and Wait Parts one and two. One Christmas Eve. They've come, they've come. This was the cry of little Herbert as he ran in from the square stone which made the large doorstep of the house. Here he had been watching, a self-posted sentinel, for the moment when the carriage should turn the corner at the bottom of the hill. "'They've come! They've come!' echoed joyfully through the house, and the cry penetrated out into the extension, or L, in which the grown members of the family were in the kitchen, getting tea by some formulas more solemn than ordinary. "'Have they come?' cried grace and she set her skillet back to the quarter-deck or after part of the stove lest its white contents should burn while she was away she threw a waiting handkerchief over her shoulders and ran with the others to the front door to wave something white and to be in at the first welcome young and old were gathered there in that hospitable open space where the side road swept up to the barn on its way from the main road the bigger boys of the home party had scattered halfway down the hill by this time even grandmamma had stepped down from the stone and walked halfway to the roadway every one was waving something those who had no handkerchiefs had hats or towels to wave and the more advanced boys began an undefined or irregular cheer but the carryall advanced slowly up the hill with no answering handkerchief and no bonneted head stretched out from the side and as it neared sam and andrew their enthusiasm could be seen to droop and george and herbert stopped their cheers as it came up to them and before it was near the house on its grieved way up the hill the bad news had come up before it as bad news will she has not come after all it was huldah root grace's older sister who had not come john root their father had himself driven down to the station to meet her and abner her oldest brother had gone with him it was two years since she had been at home and the whole family was on tiptoe to welcome her hence the unusual tea preparation hence the sentinel on the doorstep hence the general assembly in the yard and after all she had not come it was a wretched disappointment her mother had that heavy silent look which children take as the heaviest affliction of all when they see it in their mother's faces john root himself led the horse into the barn as if he did not care now for anything which might happen in heaven above or in earth beneath the boys were voluble in their rage. It is too bad! And, Grandmamma, don't you think it is too bad? And, it is the meanest thing I ever heard of in all my life. And, Grace, why don't you say anything? Did you ever know anything so mean? As for poor Grace herself, she was quite beyond saying anything. All the treasured words she had laid up to say to Huldah, all the doubts and hopes and guesses which were secret to all but god but which were to be poured out in huldah's ear as soon as they were alone were coming up one by one as if to choke her she had waited so long for this blessed fortnight of sympathy and now she had lost it grace could say nothing and poor grandmamma on whom fell the stilling of the boys was at heart as wretched as any of them somehow something got itself put on the supper-table and when john root and abner came in from the barn they all sat down to pretend to eat something what a miserable contrast to the christmas eve party which had been expected the observance of christmas is quite a novelty in the heart of new england among the lords of the manor winslow and brewster above plymouth rock celebrated their first christmas by making all hands work all day in the raising of their first house it was in that way that a christian empire was begun they builded better than they knew they and theirs in that hard day's work struck the keynote for new england 
for two centuries and a half. And many and many a New Englander, still in middle life, remembers that in childhood, though nurtured in Christian homes, he could not have told, if he were asked, on what day of the year Christmas fell. But as New England, in the advance of the world, has come into the general life of the world, she has shown no inaptitude for a greater enjoyment of life, and with the true Catholicity of her great congregational system, her people and her churches seize, one after another, all the noble traditions of the loftiest memories. And so in this matter which we have in hand, it happened that the Roots, in their hillside home, had determined that they would celebrate Christmas, as never had Roots done before, since Josiah Root landed at Salem from the Hercules with other Kentish people in 1635. Abner and Gershom had cut and trimmed a pretty fir balsam from the edge of the Hotchkiss clearing, and it was now in the best parlour. Grace, with Mary Bickford, her firm ally and other self, had gilded nuts and rubbed lady apples and strung popped corn, and the tree had been dressed in secret, the youngsters all locked and warned out from the room. The choicest turkeys of the drove, and the tenderest geese from the herd, and the plumpest fowls from the barnyard had been sacrificed on consecrated altars. And all this was but as accompaniment and side illustration of the great glory of the celebration, which was that Hulda, after her two years' absence, Hulda was to come home. And now she had not come, nay, was not coming. As they sat down at their barmecide feast, how wretched the assemblage of unrivalled dainties seemed. John Root handed to his wife their daughter's letter. She read it and gave it to Grace, who read it and gave it to her grandmother. No one read it aloud. To read aloud in such trials is not the custom of New England. Boston, December 24, 1848. Dear Mother and Father, It is dreadful to disappoint you all, but I cannot come. I am all ready, and this goes by the carriage that was to take me to the cars. But our dear little Horace has just been brought home, I am afraid, dying. But we cannot tell, and I cannot leave him. You know there is really no one who can do what I can. He was riding on his pony. First the pony came home alone, and in five minutes after two policemen brought the dear child in a carriage. His poor mother is very calm, but cannot think yet or do anything. We have sent for his father, who is downtown. I try to hope that he may come to himself, but he only lies and draws long breaths on his little bed. The doctors are with him now, and I write this little scrawl to say how dreadfully sorry I am. A Merry Christmas to you all. Do not be troubled about me, your own loving Hulda. P.S. I have got some little presents for the children, but they are all in my trunk, and I cannot get them out now. I will make a bundle Monday. Good-bye. The man is waiting. This was the letter that was passed from hand to hand, of which the contents slowly trickled into the comprehension of all parties, according as their several ages permitted them to comprehend. Sam, as usual, broke the silence by saying, it is a perfect shame. She might as well be a nigger slave. I suppose they think they have bought her and sold her. I should like to see em all, just for once, and tell em that her flesh and blood is as good as theirs, and that, with all their heirs and their money, they've no business to— Sam, said poor Grace, you shall not say such things. Hulda has stayed because she chose to stay, and that is the worst of it. She will not think of herself, not for one minute, and so everything happens. And Grace was sobbing beyond speech again, and her intervention amounted, therefore, to little or nothing. The boys, through the evening, discanted among themselves on the outrage. Grandmamma, and at last their mother, took successive turns in taming their indignation, 
but for all this it was a miserable evening. As for John Root, he took a lamp in one hand and the weekly tribune in the other, and sat before the fire, and pretended to read. But not once did John Root change the fold of the paper that evening. It was a wretched Christmas Eve, and at half-past eight every light was out, and every member of the household was lying stark awake in bed. Huldah Root, you see, was a servant with the Bartlets in Boston. When she was only sixteen, she was engaged at her trade as a vest-maker in that town, and by some chance made an appointment to sew as a seamstress at Mrs. Bartlett's for a fortnight. There was any number of children to be clothed there, and the fortnight extended to a month. Then the month became two months. She grew fond of Mrs. Bartlett because Mrs. Bartlett grew fond of her. The children adored her, and she kept an eye to them, and it ended in her engaging to spend the winter there, half seamstress, half nurse, half nursery governess, and a little of everything. From such a beginning it had happened that she had lived there six years in confidential service. She could cook better than anybody in the house, better than Mrs. Bartlett herself, but it was not often that she tried her talent there. On a birthday, perhaps, in August, she would make huckleberry cakes by the old homestead receipt for the children. She had the run of all their clothes, as nobody else did, took the younger ones to be measured, and saw that none of the older ones went out with a crack in a seam or a rough edge at the foot of a trouser. It was whispered that many had rather go into the sewing-room to get Huldah to show her about allegation or square root than to wait for Miss Thurber's explanation in the morning. In fifty such ways it happened that Huldah, who on the roll-call of the census man, probably rated as a nursery-maid in the house, was the confidential friend of every member of the family, from Mr. Bartlett, who wanted to know where the intelligencer was, down to the chore-boy who came in to black the shoes. And so it was that when poor little Horace was brought in with his skull knocked in by the pony, Huldah was, and modestly knew that she was, the most essential person in the stunned family circle. While her brothers and sisters were putting out their lights in New Durham, heartsick and wounded, Huldah was sitting in that still room where only the rough broken breathing of poor Horace broke the sound. She was changing, once in ten minutes, the ice-water cloths, was feeling of his feet sometimes, wetting his tongue once or twice in an hour, putting her finger to his pulse with a native sense which needed no second hand to help it, and all the time, with the thought of him, was remembering how grieved and hurt and heartbroken they were at home. Every half hour or less a pale face appeared at the door, and Huldah just slid across the room and said, he is really doing nicely, pray lie down, or his pulse is surely better, I will certainly come to you if it flags, or pray trust me, I will not let you wait a moment if he needs you, or pray get ready for to-morrow, an hour's sleep now will be worth everything to you then. And the poor mother would crawl back to her baby and her bed, and pretend to try to sleep and in half an hour would appear again at the door. One o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock. How companionable Dr. Lowell's clock seems when one is sitting up so, with no one else to talk to. Four o'clock at last. It is really growing to be quite intimate. Five o'clock. If I were in dear Durham now, one of the roosters would be calling. Six o'clock. Poor Horace stirs turns, flings his arm over. Mother, oh, Huldah, is it you? How nice that is! And he is unconscious again. But he had sense enough to know her. What a blessed Christmas present that is, to tell that to his poor mother when she slides in at daybreak and says, You shall go to bed now, dear child. You see, I am very fresh, and you must rest yourself, you know. 
Do you really say he knew you? Are you sure he knew you? Why, Huldah, what an angel of peace you are! So opened Huldah's Christmas morning. Days of doubt, nights of watching. Every now and then the boy knows his mother, his father, or Huldah. Then will come this heavy stupor, which is so different from sleep. At last the surgeons have determined that a piece of the bone must come away. There is the quiet gathering of the most skillful at the determined hour. There is the firm table for the little fellow to lie on. Here is the ether and the sponge. And, of course, here and there and everywhere is Huldah. She can hold the sponge, or she can fetch and carry. She can answer at once, if she is spoken to. She can wait, if it is waiting. She can act, if it is acting. At last the wretched little button, which has been pressing on our poor boy's brain, is lifted safely out. It is in Morton's hand. He smiles and nods at Huldah as she looks inquiry, and she knows he is satisfied. And does not the poor child himself, even in his unconscious sleep, draw his breath more lightly than he did before? All is well. "'Who do you say that young woman is?' says Dr. Morton to Mr. Bartlett, as he draws on his coat in the doorway after all is over. "'Could we not tempt her over to the general hospital?' "'No, I think not. I do not think we can spare her.' The boy Horace is new-born that day, a New Year's gift to his mother. So pass Huldah's holidays. 2. Christmas Again Fourteen years make of the boy, whose pony has been too much for him, a man equal to any prank of any pony. Fourteen years will do this, even to boys of ten. Horace Bartlett is the colonel of a cavalry regiment, stationed just now in West Virginia, and, as it happens, this twenty-four-year-old boy has an older commission than anybody in that region, and is the post commander at Talbot C. H., and will be, most likely, for the winter. The boy has a vein of foresight in him, a good deal of system, and what is worth while to have, by the side of system, some knack of order. So soon as he finds that he is responsible, he begins to prepare for responsibility. His staff officers are boys, too, but they are all friends, and all mean to do their best. His surgeon in charge took his degree at Washington last spring. That is encouraging. Perhaps, if he has not much experience, he has at least the latest advices. His head is level, too. He means to do his best, such as it is. And, indeed, all hands in that knot of boy counselors will not fail for laziness or carelessness. Their very youth makes them provident and grave. So, among a hundred other letters, as October opens, Horace writes this, Talbot Court House, Virginia, October 3, 1863. Dear Huldah, here we are still, as I have been explaining to Father, and as you will see by my letter to him, here we are like to stay. Thus far we are doing sufficiently well. As I have told him, if my plans had been adopted, we should have been pushed rapidly forward up the valley of the Yellow Creek. Badger's Corps would have been withdrawn from before Winchester. Wilcox and Steele together would have threatened early, and then, by a rapid flank movement, we should have pounced down on Long Street, not the great Long Street, but little Long Street, and compelled him to uncover Lynchburg. We could have blown up the dams and locks on the canal, made a freshet to sweep all the obstructions out of James River, and then, if they had shown half as much spirit on the Potomac, all of us would be in Richmond for our Christmas dinner. But my plans, as usual, were not asked for, far less taken, so, as I said, here we are. Well, I have been talking with Lawrence Worcester, my surgeon in charge, who is a very good fellow. His sick list is not bad now, and he does not mean to have it bad. 
but he says that he is not pleased with the ways of his ward masters and it was his suggestion not mine mark you that i should see if one or two of the sanitary women would not come as far as this to make things decent so of course i write to you don't you think mother could spare you to spend the winter here it will be rough of course but it is all in the good cause perhaps you know some nice women well not like you of course but still disinterested and sensible who would come too think of this carefully i beg you and talk to father and mother worcester says we may have three hundred boys in hospital before christmas if jubal early should come this way i don't know how many more talk with mother and father always yours horace bartlett p s i have shown worcester what i have written he encloses a sort of official letter which may be of use he says show this to dr hayward get them to examine you and the others and then the government on his order will pass you on i enclose this because if you come it will save time of course huldah went grace starr her married sister went with her and mrs philbrick and anna thwart that was the way they happened to be all together in the methodist church that had been of talbot court house as christmas holidays drew near of the year of grace eighteen sixty three she and her friends had been there quite long enough to be wanted to the strangeness of december in the open air on her little table in front of the desk of the church were three or four buttercups in bloom which she had gathered in an afternoon walk with three or four heads of hawksweed the beginning of one year huldah said with the end of the other nay there was even a stray rose which dr sprigg had found in a farmer's garden huldah came out from the vestry where her own bed was in the gray of the morning changed the water for the poor little flowers sat a moment at the table to look at last night's memoranda and then beckoned to the wardmaster and asked him in a whisper what was the movement she had heard in the night another alarm from early no miss not an alarm i saw the colonel's orderly as he passed he stopped here for dr fenno's case there had come down an express from general mitchell and the men were called without the bugle each man separately not a horse was to neigh if they could help it and really miss they were off in twenty minutes off who were off the whole post miss except the relief for to-day there are not fifty men in the village besides us here the orderly thought they were to go down to braxton's but he did not know here was news indeed news so exciting that huldah went back at once and called the other women and then all of them together began on that wretched business of waiting they had never yet known what it was to wait for a real battle they had had their beds filled with this and that patient from one or another post and had some gunshot wounds of old standing among the rest but this was their first battle if it were a battle so the covers were taken off that long line of beds down on the west aisle and from those under the singer's seat and the sheets and pillowcases were brought out from the linen room and aired and put on our biggest kettles are filled up with strong soup and we have our milk punch and our beef tea all in readiness and everybody we can command is on hand to help lift patients and distribute food but there is only too much time will there never be any news anna thwart and dr sprigg have walked down to the bend of the hill to see if any messenger is coming as for the other women they sit at their table they look at their watches they walk down to the door they come back to the table i notice they have all put on fresh aprons for the sake of doing something more in getting ready here is anna thwart they are coming they are coming somebody is coming a mounted man is crossing the flat coming towards us and the doctor told me to come back and tell five minutes more ten minutes more an eternity more 
And then, rat-a-tat, rat-a-tat, the mountain man is there. Wagons right behind. We begged every man of them at Wyatt's. Got there before daylight. Colonel White's men from the Yellows came up just at the same time, and we pitched in before they knew it. Three or four regiments, thirteen hundred men, and all their guns. And with no fighting? Oh, yes, fighting, of course. The Colonel has got a train of wagons down here with the men that are hurt. That's why I am here. Here is his note. Thus does the mounted man discharge his errand backward. Dear Doctor, we have had great success. We have surprised the whole post. The company across the brook tried hard to get away, and a good many of them, and of Sykes' men, are hit. But I cannot find that we have lost more than seven men. I have nineteen wagons here of wounded men. Some hurt pretty badly. Ever yours, H. So there must be more waiting. But now we know what we are waiting for, and the end will come in a finite world. Thank God, at half-past three, here they are. Tenderly, gently. Hush, Sam. Hush, Caesar. You talk too much. Gently, tenderly. Twenty-seven of the poor fellows, with everything the matter, from a burnt face to a heart stopping its beat for want of more blood. Hulda, come here. This is my old classmate, Bartho. Sat next me at prayers four years. He is a major in their army, you see. His horse stumbled and pitched him against a stone wall, and he has not spoken since. Don't tell me he is dying, but do as well for him, Hulda and the handsome boy smiled, do as well for him as you did for me. So they carried Bartho, senseless as he was, tenderly into the church, and he became E-27 on an iron bedstead. Not half our soup was wanted, nor our beef tea, nor our punch. So much the better. Then came day and night, week in and out, of army system and womanly sensibility, that quiet, cheerful, homish hospital life in the quaint surroundings of the whitewashed church, the pointed arches of the windows and the faded moreen of the pulpit telling that it is a church in a reminder not unpleasant, two or three weeks of hopes and fears, failures and successes, bring us to Christmas Eve. It is the surgeon-in-chief who happens to give our particular Christmas dinner, I mean the one that interests you and me. Hulda and the other ladies had accepted his invitation. Horace Bartlett and his staff and some of the other officers were guests, and the doctor had given his own permit that Major Bartho might walk up to his quarters with the ladies. Hulda and he were in advance, he leaning with many apologies on her arm. Dr. Sprigg and Anna Thwart were far behind. The two married ladies, as needing no escort, were in the middle. Major Bartho enjoyed the emancipation, was delighted with his companion, could not say enough to make her praise the glimpses of Virginia, even if it were West Virginia. "'What a party it is, to be sure,' said he, the doctor might call on us for our stories, as one of Dickens' chiefs would do at a Christmas feast. Let's see, we should have the surgeon's tale, the general's tale, for we may at least make believe that Hod's stars have come from Washington. Then we must call in that one-eyed servant of his, and we will have the orderly's tale. Your handsome friend from Wisconsin will tell the German's tale. I shall be encouraged to tell the prisoner's tale. And you? And I? said Hulda, laughing, because he paused. You shall tell the saint's tale. Bartho spoke with real feeling, which he did not care to disguise. But Hulda was not there for sentiment, and without quivering in the least, nor making other acknowledgment, she laughed as she knew she ought to do, and said, Oh, no, that is quite too grand. The story must end with the superintendent of special reliefs tale. It is a little unromantic to the sound, but that's what it is. 
"I don't see," persisted the Major, "if Superintendent of Special Relief means saint in Latin, why we should not say so." "Because we are not talking Latin," said Huldah. "Listen to me, and before we come to dinner, I will tell you a story pretty enough for Dickens, or any of them. And it is a story not fifteen minutes old." "'Have you noticed that black-whiskered fellow under the gallery, by the north window?' "'Yes, the same. He is French, enlisted, I think, in New London. I came to him just now, managed to say et trends et noel to him, and a few other French words, and asked if there were nothing we could do to make him more at home. Oh, no, there was nothing. Madame was too good, and everybody was too good, and so on. But I persisted. I wished I knew more about Christmas in France, and I stayed by. Uh, no, madam, nothing. There is nothing. Uh, but since you say it, if there were two drops of red wine, du vin de mon pays, madam, but you would not hear in Virginia. Could not I? A superintendent of special relief has long arms. There was a box of claret, which was the first thing I saw in the storeroom the day I took my keys. The doctor was only too glad the man had thought of it, and you should have seen the pleasure that red glass, as full as I could pile it, gave him. The tears were running down his cheeks. Anna there had another Frenchman, and she sent some to him and my man is now humming a little song about the vin rouge of burgoyne would not mr dickens make a pretty story of that for you the frenchman's story bartho longed to say that the great novelist would not make so pretty a story as she did but this time he did not dare you are not going to hear the eight stories mr dickens was not there nor indeed was i but a jolly Christmas dinner they had, though they had not those eight stories. Quiet they were, and very, very happy. It was a strange thing, if one could have analyzed it, that they should have felt so much at home, and so much at ease with each other, in that queer Virginian kitchen where the doctor and his friends of his mess had arranged the feast. It was a happy thing that the recollections of so many other Christmas homes should come in, not sadly, but pleasantly, and should cheer rather than shade the evening. They felt off soundings, all of them. There was, for the time, no responsibility. The strain was gone. The gentlemen were glad to be dining with ladies, I believe. The ladies, unconsciously, were probably glad to be dining with gentlemen. The officers were glad they were not on duty, and the prisoner, if glad of nothing else, was glad he was not in bed. But he was glad for many things beside. You see, it was but a little post. They were far away, and they took things with the ease of a detached command. "'Shall we have any toasts?' said the doctor, when his nuts and raisins and apples at last appeared. "'Oh, no, no toast, nothing so stiff as that.' "'Oh, yes, oh, yes,' said Grace. "'I should like to know what it is to drink a toast, something I have heard of all my life and never saw.' "'One toast at least, then,' said the doctor. "'Colonel Bartlett, will you name the toast?' "'Only one toast?' said Horace. "'That is a hard selection. We must vote on that.' "'No, no,' said a dozen voices, and a dozen laughing assistants at the feast offered their advice. "'I might give the country. I might give the cause. I might give the president. And everybody would drink,' said Horace. "'I might give absent friends or home sweet home. But then we should cry.' "'Why do you not give the trepanned people?' said Worcester, laughing, or the silver-headed gentleman. "'Why don't you give the staff and the line? Why don't you give here's hoping? Give next Christmas. Give the medical department, and may they often ask us to dine.' "'Give saints and sinners,' said Major Bartho, after the first outcry was hushed. 
"'I shall give no such thing,' said Horace. "'We have had a lovely dinner, and we know we have, and the host, who is a good fellow, knows the first thanks are not to him. Those of us who ever had our heads knocked open, like the Major and me, do know. Fill your glasses, gentlemen. I give you the special diet kitchen." He took them all by surprise. There was a general shout, and the ladies all rose and dropped mock courtesies. "'By Jove!' said Bartho to the Colonel afterwards. "'It was the best toast I ever drank in my life. Anyway, that little woman has saved my life. Do you say she did the same to you?' End of Story 5 Parts 1 and 2